And we're back. Greetings, everyone. This is Lucian Vilsan, broadcasting from Cluj-Napoca, Transylvania. As always, alongside with me is Herr Jon Gunnarsson, broadcasting from Deutschland, and our producer, James Huff, making sure everything works just fine, broadcasting from the States. Greetings, Jon. Good evening. I'm doing well because it's raining and it's been cooler this last uh, couple of days. Um, how are you doing? Fuck you. <laughs> 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 it's been enormously hot uh, continuously for the last uh, basically for uh, for the last 10 days I mean last time it rained it was last Thursday or last Wednesday evening or something like that and it hasn't been raining at all since and in in the coldest day the temperature during the day uh, reached only as high as 41 in Celsius. In most of the days, were more like 47. Um, today was something like 46, I think, uh, at uh, at its peak, and 44 as an average for the day. Even now, even though it's 9 p.m. local time, uh, it's still something like 39 or 38. I can't see from where I am uh, the ter thermometer clearly, but it's either 38 or 39. Um, and no wind, very hard to breathe, enormously uh, hot. So yeah, I'm, I'm getting very good training for <clears throat> for the next period because I'm going into the hottest capital cities of Europe. So <laughs> at least I won't be surprised. Sounds like awful, like an awful plan. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, one has to sacrifice for the cause, doesn't it? <laughs> Yeah, we'd probably be glad right now to be visiting Sweden again. Uh, yeah, to be fair, yes. I mean, uh, that's the only part that I really loved in Sweden. Uh, I mean, ev even when the Swedes were complaining about the heat, I'm like, uh, dudes, I just flew from Bucharest. Shut the fuck up. This is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and now the problem is with the people, but at least where I'm going, it won't be a problem with the people, but the weather will kill me for sure, uh, which, which is why I'm going now and not waiting any longer, because if I get uh, old enough, I won't be physically able to, <laughs> um, <laughs> to withstand um, that kind of climate. So yeah, speaking of that, uh, uh, maybe I, should, I might as well say it now, um, enjoy this episode while it lasts, because there will be at least three at least four weeks of break if not five so yeah so with all of that said we have a remarkably short news section but with um, uh, at least two if not three uh, I, I think it will be eventually three contentious topics on which we'll spend uh, a disproportionate amount of time and probably the first topic is the one that will eat the most of the time because, uh, well, it's because it's everywhere. So yeah, you can hardly escape it right now. Yeah, yeah. So go ahead. Let, okay. Take us into the main headlines. Okay, this particular piece is one of hundreds, and it's coming from the Telegraph. Julian Assange offers job to fired Google employee who wrote anti-diversity memo. Julian Assange has offered to the Google employee who was fired for writing an anti-diversity memo a job at WikiLeaks. Assange, who is currently in the Ecuadorian embassy, tweeted multiple times in support of James Damore, the engineer who wrote the memo, which went viral. He said, Censorship is for losers. At WikiLeaks is offering a job to fire Google engineer James Damore. Women and men deserve respect. That includes not firing them for politely expressing ideas, but rather arguing back. He had previously tweeted, Identity Politics 2.0 wars come to Google. Oh no, but mass spying is fine since it's equal opportunity and predation. The engineer who wrote the memo was fired for perpetuating gender stereotypes, he said in an email to Reuters on Monday. Google chief executive uh, Sander Pikachi, uh, or, or Sander Pikai or whatever, uh, told employees in a note on Monday that, uh, that portions of the anti-diversity memo quote, violate our code of conduct and cross the line by advancing harmful gender stereotypes in our workplace, according to a copy of the note seen by Reuters. Mr. Damore's memo attacked the idea that gender diversity should be a goal. Quote, the distribution of preferences and abilities of men and women differ in part due to biological causes, and these differences may explain why we don't see equal representation of women in tech and leadership, Damore wrote in the internal company memo last week. 
Google's Vice President of Diversity, Danielle Brown, sent a memo in response to the furore over the weekend, saying the engineer's essay advanced incorrect assumptions about gender. The 10-page document was initially posted on the company's internal forum. Critics reacted angrily to its uh, argument that the lack of women in tech companies was down to genetic factors, saying it was evidence for Silicon Valley's hostility to women and minorities. I really hope that the chief executive is not Hungarian, because if she is, that would mean make her name Sundar Pichoy, which means Sundar the cunt. Um, <laughs> so in a way, I hope she is Hungarian, because they would be much fitting. Um, yeah. Um, so um, where do we start? Uh, I presume you already read the infamous memo. Um, I read part. I didn't read every word. Some parts, some parts I skimmed. But from what I read, it seemed pretty reasonable. Sorry. Yeah. At first, when I saw it, and you know, I saw it long before it went viral. That means like 24 hours before everyone else, uh, <laughs> because that's what long before means in internet terms these days. Um, it at first it, it it came off to me as more of a progressive. Uh, piece of work. I mean, it didn't even argue against diversity, even though I believe it should. Uh, it just said, uh, if you really want diversity, and he emphasized several times that he does want diversity, which I think is insane, but whatever. Um, here are methods to do it without actively discriminating against people. Now, we once could discuss whether his prop proposals have any merit. But to call it an anti-diversity memo is just a lie. It's not. Um, and uh, the genetic portion is, uh, well, IQ is partly he heredited, um, inherited uh, genetically. And uh, when it comes to the uh, extreme end of, uh, uh, of the bell curve, yes, there are more male geniuses than female geniuses. So yes, there is... Definitely genetics plays some part in it. Why is that so controversial? It's just science. Yeah, I mean, I don't think, I don't think the IQ part is really very important. I don't think it features very prominently in this uh, manifesto. It's more about... Uh, no, it doesn't. It's just a side note. Yeah, it's, it's more about uh, personality traits in which men and women differ quite a mm -hmm. lot more. I mean, with IQ, that's this sort of uh, uh, variance is, is a bit higher for men than for women. Um, but really, the much bigger differences are in psychological traits, and um, that sort of stuff is, is what the memo focuses more on. And I mean, th that stuff is not is not controversial science or anything like that. That's just sort of mainstream science, it's sort of your know, big five personality models sort of stuff. That's uh, pretty much the gold standard in psychology, um, yeah. and it's well established that there are some pretty large differences there between men and women. Um, mm -hmm. This is not, as far as the scientific claims go that they're made in this uh, manifesto, it's uh, pretty standard stuff that uh, um, should, that would not really raise an eyebrow from, uh, say, a psychologist who specializes in this sort of stuff. Yeah. Uh, also, the claim by the, I love, I love it, the vice president of diversity. I, I think the entire planet would be better off if all vice presidents of diversity of all organizations would just disappear. Uh, <laughs> I think the entire planet would be objectively better off. Anyway, uh, this individual, Danielle Brown, um, you know, her claim that uh, the essay advanced incorrect assumptions about gender. First of all, it didn't advance any assumption. It advanced facts. And no, they weren't incorrect. And I, I can understand that they're controversial, for a special snowflake or for a progressive or for a vice president of diversity, same thing really. Uh, I can understand they're controversial, but incorrect? No, sorry, they're not incorrect. Not even by a long shot. Yeah, I mean, the, the sort of claims that, um, uh, that the underrepresentation of women in science um, is, uh, in large part or in a significant part due to those differences. That is maybe a bit of a bit more of a controversial claim because, I mean, um, establishing causality is always a very difficult uh, thing to do in science. So I can understand why there's like a reasonable disagreement over 
whether this sort of uh, drawing of causal links is accurate. Um, but as, as far as the uh, assumptions about gender and so on that are in there, there's nothing that's that that could reasonably be, um, or not, not nothing that is nothing that is unreasonable, nothing that uh, uh, would justify this sort of um, virulent re reaction against this memo. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, uh, the reason I mentioned uh, that particular portion is because, uh, of course, there have been. Uh, uh, it, this story is literally everywhere. Uh, I prepared the video about it. I hope I'll get to record it tomorrow. I just hope have so many stuff to do. But um, until I get to do that, um, <clears throat> there there have been uh, published stories on e everywhere, and some outlets chose to publish mostly uh, stories uh, in line with the progressive party line. But some outlets, such as Bloomberg, decided to uh, publish mostly uh, non-progressive stories. And one that really caught my eye, I mean, Bloomberg published like 20 stories about this. Um, but one that really caught my eye is, um, the, I don't know where to put the link, but it's from Bloomberg and it's called, As a Woman in Tech, I Realized These Are Not My People. And um, of course, it's very long, but um, it has a, a, that sort of aha moment uh, where... Um, uh, which I, I think it would be it would enhance the conversation. So please allow me to read this portion. Uh, it says the reason I left is that I came into work one Monday morning and joined the guys at our work table. And one of them said, "What did you do this weekend?" I was in the throes of, of a brief doomed romance. I had attended a concert that Saturday night. I answered the question with an accent, with an account of both. The guys stared blankly, then silence. Then one of them said, well, I built a fiber channel network in my basement. And our co-workers fell all, all over themselves, asking him to describe every step in loving detail. At that moment, I realized that fundamentally, these are not my people. I like the work, but I was never going to like it enough to blow a weekend doing more of it for free, which meant that I was never going to be as good at that job as the guys around me. Close quote. Um, that pretty much settles it, in my opinion. I mean, uh, <laughs> this, this is how these kinds of environments work. Um, when, when you compete with well, essentially maniacs, you know, uh, people who really, really love their job, you can be as credentialed as you want. You're never going to be as good as they are. Yeah, that's that's also something that um, that I myself uh, realized. I was you know, working part-time as a software developer. And um, the thing is, I, I, I like programming. It's... Uh, something I like to do, but there's also like lots of things that are surrounding that, that um, I'm not particularly fond of all this sort of uh, stuff we have to uh, constantly use, uh, find this, this next sort of tool and you have to um, yeah. um, do all sorts of bug fixing because you have the different, um, uh, different platforms, different tools that you have to use for a particular task and uh, there's not, a, not that much time you actually spend on like actual coding. Um, and it's also not something that I like want to do lots of, th lots of my free time. And that's just people like I was working with who were just a lot more passionate about that sort of thing. And, uh, I just realized that, you know, I can't really keep up with these guys. Um, it, it, it's something that, uh, I mean, if, if you were sort of, um, um, leftist oriented, you also you might say that this is you know that is unfair that sort of uh, regular people who are sort of reasonably good at programming can't uh, just uh, uh, can't compete with these guys who are um, sort of being unfair by you know, working essentially um, 14, 14 days uh, fourteen um, uh, hours a day on uh, on program related stuff and uh, you know can't keep up with that how is that fair? But I mean, that's just how it is. There's apparently some people who just enjoy, you know, programming the sort of tech stuff so much that they devote their entire lives to it. And uh, as sort of a normal person, it's hard to keep up with that. Mm -hmm. And you might say that's not fair or something, but that's the way it is. And I think it's it's great for everyone else who gets to enjoy all these uh, great tech products that these people produce at 
at a lower price than it would otherwise be if it were just some sort of activity that no one particularly enjoyed and uh, people would uh, um, just have to be paid like a really high amount to just like eight hours um, mm. a day of uh, of coding. Mm. Whereas there's lots of people who do lots of coding for free, which is why, for example, there's uh, lots of you know, free software you can get uh, that's you know, really high quality. Mm. Um, yeah, I, I'm running. I'm running the 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 show now on free software. It's Linux. It's yeah. a free browser, a free audio driver, free everything. Really, I mean, the only thing that I paid is the computer per se, but anything else it was free. Not just free as in freedom, but also free of charge. And uh, in Linux environments, it's probably the, the Linux environment is probably the one that explains the best why. Uh, these sorts of leftist feminist narratives just don't work. Because if you remember, there was a time, um, <clears throat> roughly in early 2016, late 2015, when feminists tried to infiltrate Linux communities. And it ended in a spectacular failure. Um, the failure was not that spectacular as in the gaming community for the simple reason that, at least in the gaming community, the feminists got to uh, have a decent ride for a few months until they were sniffed and uh, uh, resolutely kicked out. But in the Linux community, they couldn't even get in. <laughs> because uh, in, in the Linux community, you just can't, you, you can't just be there and um, you know, work your way through the hierarchy and then end up in a position where you can influence stuff. You just can't. You're either good or you're not. And in, uh, in most uh, Linux distributions, nobody even knows who you are, or where you're from. I mean, the, for instance, I contribute to two different Linux distributions, and nobody knows that it's me there. I don't, I don't use the, the nickname with my name or Freedom Alternative or anything. I use something that is completely unrelated, and um, nobody knows that I'm me. So it, it's by far the most meritocratic community, which is why it's, uh, it's one of the, those communities that feminists can't even get in. Yeah, in in general, the whole tech world is uh, very meritocratic, and uh, it's also very very competitive. And something, and to, to get sort of at the at the top rungs of uh, you know, working at uh, say a, a company like Google, um, you need to be pretty damn good and pretty damn devoted, and perhaps even sort of stupidly, single-mindedly, unreasonably devoted, which is um, a characteristic that a lot more men possess than women, and it's not necessarily a, a criticism of women because uh, in a lot of cases it's, it's actually you know unreasonable to be so uh, devoted to your work and to you know work fourteen hours a day on something when you come 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 back home and uh, you know think more about uh, um, work related stuff and uh, you know build a fiber optics network in your basement just be, just for fun. Um, that that's maybe not not even not even a reasonable thing, but uh, a lot of men are sort of stupidly devoted to things like that, and uh, that is why they are successful and they they pay a high price for that. But it's something that's a, a price that most women are not willing to pay. And you know, personally, I wouldn't be willing to pay such a price, um, which is why I'm not re working at Google. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, yeah, sure, those men pay a high personal price, but then again, they also get the uh, rewards in other ways, such as in status, prestige, and of course, money. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, uh, most Google workers are paid amounts that uh, uh, regular Janes and those uh, might have a difficult time reaching to that amount, especially the, t the top developers. Um, Oh, with that said, yeah, in the end, uh, it, I'm still reading through the Bloomberg piece, and it goes precisely on the same uh, vein. It says, uh, but look, thinking back to those women I knew in IT, I can't imagine any of them would have spent a weekend building a fiber channel network in her basement. And I'm not saying such women don't exist. They, I know they do. I'm just saying that if they exist in equal numbers to the men, it's odd that I've met so very, uh, so very many men like that and not even one woman like that in a job where all the women around me were pretty, obviously pretty comfortable with computers. And we can't blame it on residual sexism. <clears throat> 
uh, the number of women working with computers has actually gone down over time. And I find it hard to blame it on current sexism. No one told that guy to go home and build a fiber channel network. No one told me I couldn't. It's just that I would never, in a million years, have chosen to waste a weekend that way. And the higher you go up that ladder, ladder the more important those preferences become. Um, but then again, uh, pointing out these things makes you a sexist in the, um, in the current year. Yep. And mind you, these kinds of things are not just specific to the tech um, business. Um, although, admittedly, I will... Uh, I could po point an example from sort of my own business. I mean, I'm a security consultant, uh, uh, freelance, um, partly tech, but partly non-tech. Um, basically, I teach people to be discreet. Um, and uh, there's a lot of, um, in this field, there are many, many uh, women who try to climb up the ladder. Uh, and uh, up until somewhere a, a little bit above the middle, uh, of the ladder, uh, there are quite a lot of women. But beyond that, not so much. Why? Well, it comes down to this like this. I mean, I would rather spend an entire night um, reading about some obscure security tool and then testing it um, than uh, go out in a club. Now, admittedly, I never win. I, I never like going to a club, but <laughs> I'm just saying. Uh, <laughs> uh, there are many, many socially acceptable activities that I would rather postpone or not do at all in favor of reading about some obscure security tool that just emerged from an obscure free software forum or whatever and reviewing the code. Um, and because I know about that, most of my competition doesn't know about that. Eventually, when push comes to shove in, the, in certain contracts, I get to win the bidding uh, uh, much more easily, precisely because I know some of these obscure things that uh, no one in the established business even considers that they might exist, let alone actively research them. Uh, and these kinds of um, uh, off-the-clock preferences do make the difference. Now, admittedly, that difference is much more obvious in freelance uh, uh, realm, uh, where I am, than in companies. But still, in companies, eventually, especially on the top end, uh, these are also obvious. Yeah, and uh, I mean, the, the, the whole accusation against this piece is that uh, it's uh, sexist, that it's uh, um, that it sort of puts women down and so on, but I, whenever someone says that, they don't actually provide any sort of evidence of him saying any sort of, making any sort of sexist remarks or anything like that. At least, at least I haven't found any um, that could uh, reasonably be called sexist. Mm -hmm. um, he just points out that there are some differences between men and women, that some of them, that uh, there are biological differences, which is pretty obviously true. Um, and he sort of makes the inference that some of these differences are responsible for the um, differences in attack employment. And uh, I mean, it, it's not like uh, women are underrepresented in every prestigious career. There's other um, prestigious careers where women are doing quite well. Like women are doing uh, uh, quite well right now in, say, um, medicine or law. There's, at least if you look at, uh, you know, um, at, at younger women who are entering these, these careers in the you know, last uh, couple of years, um, they're women and, and women are doing just fine. And, and uh, uh, it, it's, it's not like um, uh, programmers are more well respected than uh, lawyers or or doctors. Quite the opposite, probably. Quite the opposite, yeah. Um, and also, it's even inside STEM. I mean, uh, if there is a hostility in STEM towards women, then someone please explain to me why seventy percent of biologists are women. Um, I mean, <laughs> just saying, if there is a systemic hostility to women in STEM, then uh, then how come women uh, almost achieved parity on ma in mathematics and are doing reasonably well in engineering too? Um, so it's just that the tech field is uh, of such a nature that um, it can't really get to that level anytime soon, and I would argue if ever. 
Uh, not to mention that Google is being held here by the progressives at an unreasonable standards, uh, standard. I mean, 80%, sorry, 18%, one eight um, of, um, uh, of graduates in, uh, in technology-related uh, fields are women. So expecting Google to have 40% women is just unreasonable. Now, admittedly, Google, just like Microsoft and other companies, also do employ people who don't have um, necessarily the studies and the credentials, but they do have the skills. But even so, the, the, that's, uh, that, that still can't account to uh, the difference between how many graduates exist and how many uh, employees they can have. I mean, um, the only way they could reasonably fulfill it would be for them to employ the entire promotion of <laughs> several years, um, and then uh, maybe they would reach uh, the the target that arbitrarily the progressives uh, set uh, set up for it. Um, that's one thing. Oh, and uh, and also this whole thing that um, uh, oh, there's Silicon Valley's hostility to women and minorities. I'm sorry. Uh, if there if, if that were true, then whites wouldn't have been underrepresented in Google because they are, uh, and Asians wouldn't be overrepresented at Google because they are. Yeah, so, massively so. Massively so, yeah. I mean, Asians are like what two or three percent of the American population, but they're like thirty percent of Google. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, uh, this whole business of hostility to women and minorities is is just asinine. And this is yeah. this this is what really pisses me off because it's these are so blatant lies at this point. I mean, I I, I remember the time when we'd have to work or at least think for five or maybe seven seconds before coming up with a counter argument to a feminist claims uh, to a feminist claim but these days it's just a blatant lie yeah i mean basically the game they're playing is sort of um uh minority just means uh, whoever is not doing well so i i know one story where um um someone was working at a university that uh, um well, he had he had to uh, um, fill a particular, uh, or he had to hire a particular um, employee under a grant that uh, said he had to hire someone who was a minority. Um, so he said, you know, I have this you know, Jewish applicant, uh, I'm going to hire this guy. And then the response came, no, 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 you can't do that, choose another minority. And I mean, <laughs> these are a <laughs> tiny, tiny sliver of the American population. Um, by any accounts a minority, they're also a minority that has a you know, history of facing uh, very harsh discrimination and uh, persecution, but they're doing well, they're successful, um, so therefore they're not a minority. That's how it works in a progressive world, apparently. Mm -hmm. so be, because yeah. Asians, they're also you know, doing actually a bit better, better than whites in the United States, so... Yeah, but they're not the, they're not the most wealthy, the wealthiest group. Uh, the wealthiest group is, uh, uh, is Indian Americans, as a matter of fact. Um, I didn't say that it was the wealthiest group, but I said they were doing slightly better than whites. Yeah, 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 they're doing, they're doing better, better than whites and, uh, and, and better than Jews. Um, and they're, they're either the second or the third richest ethnic group. Uh, in the United States, and also uh, whites is quite a wide category because you know whites of an Irish descent, for instance, are doing worse than whites of German descent, for instance. Or uh, when it comes to immigrants from Eastern Europe, whites of Romanian descent are doing better than whites of Albanian descent. Uh, so you know, if you really want to split hairs here. Uh, you can reasonably make the case that basically anyone not Indian American and Asian American is in some way a, a, an oppressed minority, uh, which would be insane. But this is the logical conclusion if you follow the uh, progressive logic here. Yeah, but with all those uh, groups, it's always a matter of how we define them. You could also say um, we define uh, all uh, Eurasians as one um, ethnic group, and then, uh, you know, obviously then... Uh, um, People from China say they're Eurasians and therefore the majority, and therefore not a minority. Um, you, you, you could define these groups however you want and uh, um, get different results, uh, which is why it's maybe doesn't make a whole lot of sense to talk about. You know, this is the most uh, oppressed group or the most uh, or successful um, minority group because it always depends on you know, how you draw those boundaries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. 
but it, I, ha I hate to agree with Julian Assange here, but this is really uh, identity politics 2.0 words coming at Google. Uh, I mean, uh, it, it, I have to also try to empathize, I guess, with the top brass at Google because uh, th think of it from their perspective. You're in Silicon Valley. Uh, from where you live or, and you work, conservatives don't exist. Uh, people with a different opinion than the progressive orthodoxy don't exist. That's how you perceive the world if you stay, if you spend too much time there. Um, and uh, from their perspective, uh, they tend to perceive that they lose more if they piss off leftists than if they piss off uh, what I like to call normal people. Well, because I don't think you have to be a conservative or a libertarian to, to figure out that uh, what this guy wrote is just mainstream science and uh, yeah maybe some controversial claims but then again let's not forget this memo was written on a platform that said let's debate the diversity of ideas let's debate diversity Th that was the purpose um, it's interesting that we never learned who leaked it uh, because that might answer some questions uh, so <laughs> I can understand even though disagree I can understand the top brass at Google not this chief diversity lady no she should be helicoptered but uh, the, the topper brass who uh, who just sees the headlines and the scandal and they're like no no we have to do something yeah I mean as, as far as the manifesto goes I think it's uh, it's perfectly possible for a reasonable person to disagree with the claims made in it but um, to say that it's somehow malicious or that it's sexist or something like that is just uh, completely unreasonable it seems to me um, and yeah it, it's it's also reasonable that sort of the um, top brass at Google wants to want to cover their asses and uh, um, I can understand that but still it seems uh, but they might re might regret it because uh, this is basically and I think it could be the final point they made a huge mistake because uh, if the information that I saw, I seen in the Daily Wire is correct, and uh, later on the Guardian also confirmed it, so it might be correct, namely that there are a bunch of um, cackling feminist cunts at Google uh, lawyering up for a class action lawsuit against Google, claiming uh, systemic sexism, of course. Um, and if that thing goes to court, well, Google will have to defend itself using that memo. <laughs> basically <laughs> using the facts from that memo. <laughs> uh, if it doesn't go to court um, Google will uh, will still have to settle and uh, uh, but uh, but after settling soon enough they'll have to update their policies somehow to uh, never allow that thing to happen again uh, also there is uh, reasonably credible evidence that um, Basically, around 40% of Google employees who read the memo agreed in part or in total with the memo. And 60-something percent, almost two-thirds of Google employees who read the memo agreed definitely that the memo is not harmful nor in any way, uh, quote-unquote, problematic. So this is a case of the top brass being completely disconnected, not just from the outside world, outside Silicon Valley and outside California, but even of their own workforce. Yeah, we've been saying this again and again, this sort of um, progressive feminist um, people are not the majority. They are a very loud and well-connected minority. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of people in in academia, a lot of people in, uh, in the media are on their side, but in the French general population, um, not so much. So much, yeah. Um, yeah, and uh, it, it's really funny. That, uh, now, of course, Breitbart started a series uh, 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 conducted by Alan Bakari, uh, which is one of the few nice guys still left at Breitbart, um, called The Rebels at Google, with interviews, uh, some of them anonymous, some of them with full name, with current employees from Google who talk about the ideological echo chamber and whatnot. And I don't know if you've got the chance to see these, uh, this guy's interview, James Damore's interview with, uh, with uh, Professor Jordan Peterson. Um, because in that interview, he mentioned uh, the quote-unquote unrecorded diversity meetings, which might in fact violate some of the progressive anti-discrimination laws. 
Now, I would really love to see someone going in there and recording them all and releasing them all on Daily Motion, not on YouTube. Um, <laughs> uh, I, the thing is that if the forces, as I say usually on my channel, the forces of the non-left, if the forces of the non-left play their cards right, it could strike a... I'm not saying it could take down Google. It won't, but it would strike a serious blow uh, to Google if this thing is played right. Yeah, and, it, and it's important to sort of send that kind of message such that uh, the next time a big corporation like Google faces something like that, um, maybe they won't fire the guy. Maybe they'll just release a public statement saying, you know, we don't agree with this, uh, what this person said, but, uh, you know, it's his right to have his opinion. Maybe something like that will happen next time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if the consequences are high enough for Google, uh, it, it will not only send the message, but for, remember, most of these tech companies are located, at least judicially, in the United States. That means in the most litigious, uh, lawsuit happy culture in the world and uh, the cover your ass policies will quietly but consistently be updated in such a way to prevent a similar shitstorm uh, in the future just saying and if yeah. the consequences are high enough for, for Google we might actually uh, see a fundamental change in the way these tech giants behave themselves essentially yeah and uh, I from what I've heard, it's also quite possible that uh, James Samoa might successfully sue Google for some sort of unrightful termination. Yeah, the, the, there is a case to be made that um, he has, a, a, I don't know exactly the, the exact legal word, but, uh, but yeah, something like that, uh, unfair dismissal or something like that. But uh, it doesn't even matter if he wins. He probably should sue anyway just to... Um, um, j j just to, to compel Google to come at the negotiation table? I don't know. I don't know all the details behind of it, and the lawyering is just impossible. I mean, I've read a huge, a long essay from a, a labor lawyer, uh, a conservative guy, who explained what and how it can be done, and the, just reading it sounds incredibly complex. And uh, This is what I don't like about uh, countries uh, with, with common law. Their, their, law be, their laws become so unreasonably complex that it's just impossible for even w for, for someone with a much higher IQ and accustomed with complex thinking, it's still very hard to follow. So normal people just can't follow the law, even if they want to. Yeah, that, that's just a huge problem. And uh, basically, if, if you... Uh, if you can't reasonably find out what the law is, then how are you supposed to actually follow it? Because, I mean, we have yeah. this legal principle that uh, ignorance of the law is, is not uh, an excuse, not a defense, um, which is, you know, reasonable as far, as as far as it goes, because otherwise you'd be encouraging people to be ignorant of the law, which is obviously not what you want. But uh, then you have to make law in such a way that people can actually understand uh, at least the relevant laws pertaining to them. and. Uh, Nowadays, it's not really possible anymore. Yeah, it's it's not possible, and it is particularly a problem with. Uh, I mean, if, if I want to see how unfair dismissals work from a legal perspective in, uh, I don't know, Norway or France, you know, countries for, uh, whose languages I speak, in two hours I can know everything that needs to be known about labor law. If I want to know how these things work in the United States. I, I, I wouldn't be able to find out uh, the whole of it uh, even in a week, let alone in, in, in a few hours or a day. Because you have, you have in, in common law countries, you have the law, then you have the local law, and then you have case law. And you have to dig up into older cases and all of them and see which one fit and build up a case law around your case. It's, it, it's insane. I'm sorry. It just is. Yeah, maybe maybe it made sense when the principle. I mean, common law historically has been a, an advantage over countries with Roman law, but lately, not anymore. Lately, it, it just became uber insane. Yeah. Right. Let's go. Oh, the next one is from our friend, isn't it? Okay, the next one is from our uh, special friend, <laughs> um, the most famous uh, feminist in Germany, Alice Schwarzer. Um, who writes at uh, Decide. Um, 
and a piece is called uh, Der Ruf Mord, which is uh, uh, something like character assassination. Um, and it's a really, really extremely long piece. And unfortunately, Schwarzer does not write in a very concise way. So I've just cut very, very liberally from it. And I'm just, go I'm just going to read some parts of it and just sort of summarize the rest. Um, so here goes. The relevant piece in the current issue of Emma, which is the magazine that uh, Schwarzer runs, was written by the former gender studies student, uh, uh, Vujin Sasha Vukadinovich, and is based on a collection of essays, Beisreflexe, in which queer activists criticize their own movement. When it appeared in book form, there was a heated controversy and the authors were threatened with violence. Now that Emma provided a platform for this debate, Judith Butler and Sabine Haag reacted personally in the Zeit, and what a reaction it was. The chief thinker of queer theory, uh, Judith Butler, accuses Emma not only of undifferentiated undifferentiated thinking and hate speech, but also of racism. Uh, skipping another uh, long um, passage here where they explain some sort of stuff about uh, Judith Butler's theories and uh, um, her sort of approach. Um, um, uh, continuing here to Butler, not only is gender relative, but also sex. That is not just gender roles, but sex itself, which is consistent. Once you uncouple gender roles from biological sex, the latter loses its meaning. Sex is not biological, but cultural, a result of nurture. It's constructed, as they say today, and thus could be deconstructed. Could. And this is a central problem with Butler and her followers. They take the radical thought experiments for reality. They suggest that every human being could, here and now, be whatever they wish to be at the moment and the people don't have to choose between two sexes since there are many variants and, fa and facets to gender identity. Just be queer. What a nice thought. Just be a human being. Wouldn't that be nice? A feminist utopia. And then she goes on to apply that um, sort of thinking to the um, cultural relativism uh, promoted by Judith Butler, in particular in the uh, in terms of how it relates to Islam, where Judith Butler made some sort of statement that um, um, uh, that uh, where, where she defended, you know, wearing the uh, hijab for Muslim women, saying that um, um, there's sort of a a cultural um, uh, aspect to this, and that. Um, um, it losing the burqa would be uh, to lose these sort of um, familial um, bonds and that uh, it would be uh, uh, an act of alienation and uh, sort of a, a forced westernization of Muslim women. And um, um, Ali Schwarz has been quite critical of that, uh, of that sort of thinking and uh, has uh, uh, cr uh, criticized uh, Islam for um, uh, the sort of um, idea that all women have to be um, bailed outside of their houses. And uh, uh, for that, she's basically been attacked as being a racist because that's how it goes with the left these days. Um, whereas uh, Alice Schwarzer sort of argues that um, uh, Islam is basically sort of hyper masculinity that it's sort of um, um, basically the worst of, of, of masculinity on full display and it's basically the worst form of patriarchy whereas um, um, Butler argues that it's you know it's a, it's a different culture and we shouldn't uh, you know apply Western standards to it and blah 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 um, so I just I just thought this uh, was an interesting piece. Uh, um, An interesting piece where both are wrong. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, uh, it's interesting to, to see this sort of um, um, these inner feminist spats here where both sides sort of wrong in different ways. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it is a different culture, and but I am going to apply Western standards to it, especially if that culture manif tries to manifest itself here. Um, you don't like it, go back to Saudi Arabia. 
there would be no imposition of Western standards there. Um, it is interesting, though, that even Ali Schwarzer is now called a sexist and a racist. Um, the, I don't think I would, sexist, I think just racist. Or ju just racist for now, okay. Um, but, but she's probably called a transphobe or something because she disagrees with the gender constructionist narrative. Or if she hasn't been called yet, just wait and see. A few more months and she will. <laughs> um, it, it's really it's fascinating how these things evolved to such an extent that now uh, you really do have um, sorry, a, a significant number of academics um, <clears throat> living on that proverbial leftist pole you know uh, i usually use on facebook the meme you know it's the political compass and in the upper left corner just two squares uh, in the wall with green and says peace and love and the rest of the compass colored in red and says far right on it uh, <laughs> and and that, that's how most most academics are in that little green square where they believe they're the peace and love and everyone even mod, even a, a pubic hair to the right of them uh, they're definitely racist, far-right bigots who are just starting up the rotors or the ovens or the gulags or all three at the same time uh, and ready to oppress everyone. It's literally how they think uh, of the world uh, these days. As for yeah, uh, Judith Butler, I really I never understood why she's really given that much importance. I mean, at the end of the day, she's not. The, I mean, she's a, a professor of comparative literature or something like that at Berkeley. I mean, it's not. Uh, I believe she's a linguist, but I'm not sure. What exactly are her qualifications to talk about Islam? I mean, uh, <laughs> just saying. Um, you, you know, at least I don't pretend to be cre a credentialed imam. You know, I pretend to just know how to read the Quran and read the Hadith and make reasonable interpretations. I don't pretend to be an imam. But, you know, these university types like to dismiss <clears throat> any perspective of normal human beings saying, oh, but you don't have the credentials and the uh, qualifications to speak about that. Okay, then under that logic, what qualifications that Ju does Judith Butler have to speak about, <clears throat> about sex, about gender, or about uh, Islam? Yeah, basically Judith Butler's writings is um, lots of very obscure, hard-to-understand language that sort of basically says... Uh, well, it's complicated, and uh, <laughs> you know you can't really say that. And there's this sort of uh, um, very elaborate, um, uh, very elaborate sort of arguments that try to deconstruct everything. It sort of uh, applies this sort of super um, close scrutiny to um, all sorts of. Um, reasonable uh, constructs or reasonable um, concepts like for example sex like, like male and female um, that these are sort of reasonable um, or at least in my view they're reasonable um, categories that are very useful in describing the real world um, but then she goes along and uh, sort of finds all sorts of um, uh, very small problems with that uh, and uh, I mean, there are some very small problems with uh, um, you know, classifying human beings as male and female. Sometimes, you know, the chromosomes don't really match the outward, ex outward appearance of a person. There's, uh, you know, people with, say, um, XY chromosomes who appear to be female and, uh, mm -hmm. um, and so on. Th these sort of exceptions exist, but, you know, 99% of the time, these sort of... Um, gender binary there's you know men with xy and women with xx and uh, you know, men have a penis and women have ovaries and so on all that stuff works you know 99 percent of the time which is you know about as good as you can expect but uh, to people like judith butler that's not good enough and that you know because of that you know one percent or that fraction of one percent they would have throw over everything and um uh, just sort of reject the these sorts of uh, categories altogether um, because, it, and it's it's not because uh, these categories are not useful, not reasonable, but just because they don't like those categories. With mm -hmm. other sort of categories that uh, they have no problem with, uh, they don't apply these sort of extremely um, high standards, because if you apply these sort of extremely rig rigorous standards, you have to throw out everything. Mm -hmm. 
and that's sort of the whole idea be behind this sort of deconstruction, what? isn't that you can just throw throw out everything you don't like because you can always find some sort of small flaw, some sort of small problem, and uh, but you just uh, apply this method selectively because otherwise you just couldn't function as a human being. Mm -hmm. What you're describing is uh, a close, a consistent but <clears throat> but constant um, closing of the gap of Western, uh, of general Western feminist thought with Scandinavian feminist thought. Because what you just described is basically um, norm critique, which is the <clears throat> the t the theory of criticizing all norms, um, which is the logical conclusion of what Judith Butler is doing. But Scandinavians, as always, are a little bit more advanced on this um, because, well, because they get really bored, basically. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, basically, uh, get ready because out of this nonsense, soon enough, someone will tell Judith Butler about Norm Kritisk. And um, you're going to see everything that we've been reading in Swedish and Norwegian in the last four years at the show. Uh, sorry, three. Uh, no, four. I said, uh, yeah, in the last four years. Um, we'll soon see that all of that reprinted in English very soon. I don't know how they're... I'm, I'm very curious. And this is one of the few areas where Judith Butler could help. How the hell do you translate Norm Kritisk um, in English? Um, well, she's a linguist, so I, I'm expecting from her to come up with something. Uh, <laughs> but that's the only place where she could actually be useful. But get ready, all of that Scandinavian nonsense that was hard for me to translate on, on the show and had to constantly explain, all of that is coming in the English language. Uh, if they're already at that level, then it, it, it's only a matter of time until they catch up with the with the Scandinavians. And then everyone is fucked. Because yeah, remember... But, I, go ahead, please. I mean, that sort of deconstructionism, that's nothing particularly new. I mean... Um, as far as Judith Butler goes, her sort of main work um, was the Gender Trouble that was published. I don't remember the, the exact year, but I think somewhere like 1990 or something like that. Um, so it's, uh, it's it's not the most recent work, and uh, um, deconstruction has also been around for a couple of decades. Um, the thing is that, of course, all these... Um, methods, and I assume it's uh, the same for this norm kritisk uh, um, in in Sweden, is always applied very selectively. You know, you don't want to uh, criticize, you know, feminist norms. You don't want to criticize uh, uh, things like equality and uh, democracy and so on. Because these are nice things, and they're not, they're not to be that criticized, but you want to criticize, you know, um, uh, West and cults, you want to criticize um, men, you want to criticize uh, traditional gender roles, you want to criticize the family, all these sort of things that uh, they don't like, they get sort of um, uh, put under the microscope to find any sort of flaws, any sort of problems, but uh, all that sort of nice stuff that they like, that's of course not uh, criticized in the same way, because otherwise, as I said, they just couldn't function as normal human beings. You need to have this sort of uh, um, categories you need to differentiate between um, food and non-food items, even though there's some uh, you know things that are uh, maybe there's some sort of um, uh, fuzzy boundaries between what you can eat and what you can't eat, and some things you can eat, but you know eating too much of them is is bad for you and so on. But still, it still makes sense to differentiate between uh, say um, a rock and a piece of bread. There's one. It can't be eaten, the other can be eaten. Um, it's basically, you're making the case for discrimination. I'm, re I'm reporting you to the discriminating Zombudsman. Yep. <laughs> yeah, because it, it really is uh, a case for discrimination. It, these whole categories, I mean, when they say, oh, these categories are made to discriminate, and I'm like, yes, and that's good. <laughs> <laughs> this, this, make discriminating between, as in acknowledging the difference between, as you said, food and non-food, um, uh, men and women, and um, uh, uh, a table, not a table, a building, not a building. Uh, these sorts these uh, discriminations are necessary to uh, describe the world around you. Yeah, and in in your your daily life, if you want to sort of understand the world around you, you have to think in some of these. Uh imperfect categories because the world is a very messy place Clearly. Clearly. and uh, 
having everything super precisely defined in a way that um, uh, that you can't find any sort of a problem with it is just impossible. Um, because I mean, the world is made up of uh, you know um, hu huge numbers of uh, different atoms bouncing around randomly, and uh, no one can understand the world at this sort of level of of detail. You have to have these sort of very high level models of of, of reality that. Uh, uh, where well, you lose uh, some sort of precision, but uh, you actually get models that a human mind is able to handle. Mm -hmm. And um, in, in some cases, you want to have uh, more detailed models. When you're doing, say, um, uh, nuclear physics, you, um, you want to have this sort of uh, atom level um, of precision. But uh, if, you're, if you, say, want to um, have a conversation with another person, it's... Uh, not a, not very useful to model their brain on a, a per atom basis because you're never going to get anywhere. You have to have some sort of um, you know uh, everyday psychological knowledge. You have to have uh, um, uh, some sort of uh, preconceived notions of uh, what a person of from that cultural background would think. You have to have uh, um, some sort of gasp stereotypes about uh, <laughs> what people might do, how they how they might react, uh, and that's. Uh, useful in your everyday interaction with uh, with people because otherwise uh, you never could do or say anything because it's impossible to predict how a person might react uh, you know, someone might be offended by anything you might say you, they might be off offended by you saying um, um, hi how are you doing uh, isn't it a nice day because I don't know maybe in, maybe in their culture theoretically the word uh, day means whore or something mm -hmm. and uh, but I mean you, you have to you have to understand that you know if someone who's uh, say if, if you're in England and you meet um, someone who's white and who looks like they might be English, then if you say the word "day" to them, they're not going to to understand "whore." Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, but you see, that's uh, that's not progressive. Uh, speaking of progressive. Let's go to the, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> nice little place, also called Berlin, occasionally. Um, from Peter Berlin, Senate demands urinals for women because having them just for men would be unjust. Um, the red, red, green Senate wants to overhaul the way public lavatories are run. To that end, Environment Senator Regine Günther wrote a toilet white paper for Berlin in cooperation with the company uh, Zebralog and the Technical University of Berlin. It is stapled and comprises 97 pages. The topics covered include hygiene, safety, handicap accessibility, and so on. The chapter on gender equality starts on page 30. Here, the authors prove that it is unjust if only men are allowed to urinate while standing, but women aren't. They write, from the perspective of gender equalization, Pissoirs are unacceptable. The Senate experts do recognize that it is important to provide men with urinals since they are, quote, more prone to peeing in public than women. However, women also need to be provided with a way of relieving themselves while standing. Ordinary urinals for men cannot be used by women, so new models are needed. Where do we get those? That's what the laboratory experts of the Senate asked themselves and they found their answer with an Italian designer. His name is Matteo Thun, he lives in Milan and is the 2004 winner of the design prize Compasso d'Oro for the women's urinal Girly, which he designed for a firm called Catalano. On the website uh, stylepark.com, the firm advertises the product Girly with these words. The perfect urinal for you, touch-free thanks to its innovative form, which is adopted, uh, sorry, adapted to the female anatomy. The site does not say what one girly costs, but it does look fairly expensive. Maybe Berlin can get a discount. According to the Senate white paper, the public toilet of the future is a, quote, gender-neutral one-person stall equipped with a regular toilet and one urinal each for men and women. Um, where there are only regular pissoirs, uh, women's urinals will have to be installed. The only thing lacking in the white paper on toilets is any evidence for the necessity of women's urinals. <laughs> what, what do women say to that? Is there some sort of poll? Do women feel discriminated against when they see a pissoir because they cannot use it? 
Have they been feeling disadvantaged for the 100 years since urinals have been ex in existence? And who exactly is demanding a women's urinal? How important is this at the end of the day? The only important thing is that the public toilets will actually keep working in the future. And there's reason for doubt as the company Val is finished. Val has been managing the lavatories for 25 years without making out a bill to the Senate. The upkeep is financed through advertising. The Red Red Green Coalition does not want to renew the contract with Val, uh, with Val beyond uh, 2018, claiming that the advertising practices are not transparent. There are currently no concrete plans for who will take up the business. Only the regulations for women's urinals are already finalized. Great! That's what we've all been waiting for. After all, that is why we pay our taxes. <laughs> 97 pages of a white paper about toilets. Yep. Of which 20 of them dedicated to gender equality in toilets and about buying some weird, nobody uses type of pissoirs, allegedly tailored for women's anatomy made by some weirdo Italian. <laughs> um, not to mention that sexist in itself, it, it assumes that there is such thing as female anatomy, uh, which is sexist. Um, but anyway, uh, really, <laughs> really. I mean, isn't Berlin like a lot in, in the hole, in, in, in debt, and uh, you know, they, they might actually have some reasonably more important things to deal with? Yeah, that's uh, basically uh, they're just, I guess, they're sort of procrastinating. Like if, if you know you have to sort of write a paper for school or something, and uh, um, but you know you'd uh, that's really hard task, so you'd rather just uh, I don't know um, cook dinner instead, or uh, I don't know uh, clean your room or uh, do like anything instead because that's sort of an easier task and uh, that's some, something you can sort of manage, and I guess the Berlin Senate can manage uh, um, to. Uh, install some uh, urinals for women, for whatever reason. But uh, you're know, actually fi fixing their their budget problem. Yeah, maybe tomorrow. Yeah, well, if it hadn't been, I mean, if this story had come from, um, I don't know, the Socialist Party of France or uh, or something like that, I would have suspected that they were simply friends with the guy that owns Compasso d'Oro. And just wanted to give him some business, and uh, you know, just, just a uh, quid pro quo and classical corruption. But when it comes to Berlin, you you never know. Maybe they know the guy, maybe they don't, and they're just really that stupid. Uh, it's really hard to say. Um, <laughs> there are a few cases like that in Europe. You know, when it comes from Berlin, when it comes from the uh, Uppsala local council in Sweden, there are a few these kinds of local councils. Well, I understand that Berlin acts like its own Bundesland, but it's essentially the local council. Um, there are a few places like that where you you just don't know whether to suspect just classical corruption or just stupidity, or maybe both. <laughs> um, yeah, really, it's uh, what what the hell do you even say to this? <laughs> I would actually really be curious um, how many women are demanding this sort of product. I mean. Twenty dollars. That is no more than two percent. <laughs> yeah, probably. Like, uh, I mean, likely a lot less. But you know, I'll, I'll try to be optimistic. <laughs> also, the whole thing. Uh, like, if if you already have to put this thing in a separate stall, like, what is actually the advantage of having th this sort of urinal? I mean, the advantage of urinals is that uh, you can put a lot of them in a, a tight space. It takes a lot less space than. Um, a regular toilet stall, and uh, um, it's sort of quicker to use. But with that, and it, it's... And it can also serve a lot more people at, at the same time. Yeah. yeah. With that, I mean, I don't really see the point yet. It's, it's just sort of um, equality for equality's sake, that, you know, men yeah. can uh, pee while standing, so women should be able to do it, too. That's... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, and uh, uh, I love that that portion of the, the, the public toilet of the future will be uh, separate stalls which contain both uh, at the same time a classical toilet, a pissoir, and a 
Gelly or whatever the name of this product is. Um, mm -hmm. That's insane. I mean, that would be a ver either a very crowded stall in which a fatter person couldn't move, or the stalls will have to be uh, larger, in which case they would occupy more space and pretty much defeat the purpose um, of, um, of the current public stalls, which they just serve more people in the same space. Yeah, it's, it's completely insane. I mean, also like the justification for why they want to still provide uh, men's urinalysis that otherwise men will just, you know, pee in public. Um, <laughs> I also find that, found that quite funny. You know, you might mention something like, uh, you know, urinals um, make you know, peeing faster so that, you know, there's uh, less overcrowding. You might mention something like that, but no, you obviously you have to lash out and, you know, basically tell us that men are pigs. Um, I found that quite a nice thing. I, 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 in a way, I agree with her because if some jackass like this from this city, city council, would decide something like that, I would seek out that person in public and pee on that person. <laughs> so, yeah, it would be in public, of course. Uh, I, they, they, she didn't say where in public. Uh, so, she might also be expecting that too. Uh, because, really, I mean, uh, there's no way I can treat this seriously. I mean, so, if this were here, I would seek out the politician and pee on him. It's just a 100 euro fine. So it would be totally <laughs> worth it if, if videotaping it would be a, a, a viral YouTube video immediately. Um, <laughs> uh, and I'm, I'm not even joking. I mean, if such a, such a loon would be elected here, that's exactly what I would do. Um, and, you know, I'm no, I'm no stranger of... <clears throat> Um, threats like these. I mean, I, I threatened the, the president of the parliament that I would uh, uh, wipe my ass in public with his picture, um, and um, and he saw the video uh, and he responded. <laughs> so you know, I, I'm I'm not a, a stranger uh, to to these kinds of threats because this is exactly how you have to treat these people. Now, admittedly, the the guy that I threatened here, the, the politician that I threatened here, uh, actually heeded to uh, what I was saying. It was basically a, a, a politically correct speech law, speech code, uh, that he eventually heeded. He, admittedly, it wasn't only me, but I know for sure that he saw my video because he responded. But there were many other videos, even more colorful than mine. It was basically a law that would make it illegal to, um, to offend politicians, to offend minorities, basic political correctness stuff, which doesn't exist here. Um, and, um, you know, he basically eventually heeded to the demands and um, and cancelled the, the whole project and it's like, yeah, fuck it, no, I'm not going to put it back into the floor of the parliament. Um, but I, I, I would suspect that this individual would not heed to the demands, even if someone would tell her how would he be in public. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't really see that tactic working here in, in, in Berlin. Especially not in Berlin, yeah. <laughs> All right. Gee, the, this news section is extremely German-centric. Basically, all the news are from Germany except the first one. Um, all right. The next one is from a Romanian source, but it's about Austria. Uh, okay. Coming from hot news. The sugar mamas, old Austrian women, are buying sexual favors from refugees, some of them minors. Sex for money. Nothing new so far. There is an entire branch of business called prostitution that exists for this. In some countries, they do it legally and in others illegally or in an unclear gray area where it's tolerated. However, in Austria, there is a different growing phenomenon of picking up refugees by old women who pay for the sexual services rendered with money, gifts or, gifts or shelter in their homes. A state of dependency to which few of those who are offered can resist. A state of dependency that depersonalizes and marks the identity crisis that those who fled their own countries are going through, according to some psychologists. In the article Sugar Mamas and Their Refugees, printed last week by the Austrian publication dasbieber.at, the matter is being presented in great detail. The Austrian TV station ORF also covered the issue. Quote, In my country, I was a proper man. Here... I'm nothing, says Hassan, quoted by Das Bieber. The 24-year-old Iraqi fled his country three years ago and arrived as a refugee in Austria. In Iraq, he was a bodybuilder. In Austria, he feels like, quote, a small child, a nothing, close quote. Let's not forget that most refugees come from countries in which feminism is something from Mars or in very incipient stages. Eight months ago, uh, he was approached in a bar by a 50-something-year-old woman who, after a few glasses, just simply asked him, You're so sexy, would you like to go to my place? 
After the first night spent together, many have followed, and then the woman proposed to Hassan that he moves to her place. Hassan was sharing a two-room apartment with eight other refugees, so when the woman made the offer, he did not hesitate. What did he have to lose, rhetorically asked the authors um, of the Das Bieber article. The so-called sugar mamas aren't something new either. The idea that they express, uh, um, namely of much older women who pay young men to satisfy their sexual needs, was even the subject of a movie back in 2012 called Paradis Liebe, or The Paradise of Love, directed by Ulrich Seidel, a movie centered around the old women who vacation in Kenya, where they buy tenderness and sex from beach boys. Now, the concept of sugar mama is no longer connected just to sexual tourism. In Austria, after the refugee wave of 2015, a lot of young men without a family have also arrived. Many of these have ended up slowly to be dependent on their sugar mamas. Some of these women are members of the assistance teams that help the refugees in general. To Das Bieber, Hassan purportedly reported that he's being sexually exploited. Quote, she wants to have sex with me four times a day. I'm just a sex machine for her and nothing more. Close quote. He doesn't buy the idea that the woman loves him, although she does pay his subscription to a fitness club, his clothing and phone bills. The price for his total dependency on her, the, the price is total dependency on her. She wants me to be at all times at her disposal, completes the young Iraqi. Manfred Buchner from the Center of Male Health explains the phenomenon, quote, This is a high degree of dependency, and it's not just mental dependency, but material as well. If they leave the supermama, many of these men risk losing their landmark and end up on the streets, close quote. Peter Stibble, the president of the Austrian Federation of, uh, sorry, for Psychotherapy, explains that these men are not, quote, classical victims, unquote, of sexual exploitation since they could leave at any moment. Quote, these men are not being raped, but they are lured with material wealth. With that said, it clearly is a case of abuse, the kind of abuse that takes place when the needs and the huge material differences between the parties end up being used to satisfy the sexual needs of the rich, close quote. Besides, word goes around that among the victims of these abuses, there might also be minors. So, um... A bit disappointing that the article doesn't go a little bit more in the details about minors, but then I looked at the original story and the original story doesn't go either. Um, but I'm not particularly surprised. I mean, we've had on this show, I think, uh, at least once a story from Finland uh, where there were several old women uh, who would explicitly actually target minors. Now, admittedly, um, my level of compassion is very small. I mean, if the minor is 12, then yes, bury the bitch under the jail. But if the minor is 16, eh, eh, I don't know. I can't be bothered to care that much. Yeah, convince, I mean, me, convince me otherwise, please. In the case of a 24-year-old, I mean, he, he took her offer because he... Uh, he thought that uh, the price was worth it, and apparently he's, he's staying with her, so he thinks that it's still the price is worth it. And uh, he prefers apparently having sex with her four times a day to um, living in an overcrowded apartment with eight other refugees. And that seems fine to me. It seems like a reasonable choice uh, that that he makes for himself. And uh, I, I I just don't really see what the problem is here. Yeah, neither do I. I mean, I was told I was supposed to see the obvious exploitation, and I read the story at least three times, you know, two times in the original and one more time when I was translating it into English, and I was still like, where exactly is the problem? You know, a 24-year-old bodybuilder uh, fucks a sugar mama. So, what exactly is the problem? Um, as for... Uh, and I actually do agree with the, the first guy, the, the um, Manfred Buchner title, uh, so quoted here said from the Center of Male Health, saying that um, if they leave the supermamas, many of these men risk losing their landmark and end up on the streets. That to me likes, uh, sounds like a pro-argument, uh, namely that it is actually better that things are the way they are now than they could have, they could have otherwise been had it not been for the quote-unquote sugar mamas. Yeah, I mean, this is not exploitation. It's so so often when people scream exploitation, it's just a matter of trade for mutual benefit. Um, apparently, this young man prefers uh, you know, living with his woman and uh, um, 
having sex with her even though he might not particularly enjoy it and uh, she might not actually be in love with him but just sort of uh, uh, lust after him um, um, but you know living with her he, uh, he gets to live in a, in a comfortable apartment uh, she pays for his uh, uh, gym membership and uh, presumably all sorts of um, you know, food that he needs for his uh, bodybuilding because you need a lot of food when you're um, doing bodybuilding, you need a lot of uh, high protein food, which tends to be quite expensive. Mm. Um, he gets all of that uh, provided by her, and uh, apparently that's uh, apparently that's a good deal for him. And so I, I don't we really see like what exactly is the solution. Like obviously it would be nice if he had all these uh, things um, um, without uh, um, having to have a sugar mama and if if you know sort of that all that sort of stuff uh you know foods and uh gym memberships and apartments just fell from the sky and were provided by <laughs> divine intervention that would be nice but uh you know, in the real world we have scarcity and we do have to make decisions about uh um how we want to deal with that and uh, uh saying that this is exploitation and therefore should be stopped um isn't actually helping anyone um it isn't helping yeah. the sugar mamas. It isn't helping these uh, refugees. It's ha no one help helps no one except um, maybe it uh, solves someone's uh, outrage at uh, the injustice in yes. the world or something. Yes, and it, 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 even more so, it, it also doesn't help the society at large because again, I'm going back to this art this argument that if this situation were to be terminated somehow, uh, it is without a question that at least some of these men would end up being on the streets, committing crime, uh, going back to the edges of the society. I mean, at the end of the day, this guy is actually much closer to integration um, than uh, most of the other refugees. Um, because, you know, <clears throat> staying with this lady, obviously he learns German much faster. Um, uh, he's hanging around with the, uh, the much more core of the society rather than the edges of it that deals drugs and whatever. Um, so, uh, for all intents and purposes, this is a win-win trade-off. And like any trade-off, yes, it has some perceivably negative aspects, such as having to uh, fuck the hag four times a day. I presume that's not particularly fantastic, but uh, hey, uh, I've done a lot worse than that for, <laughs> for money in, in desperate times. And besides, uh, you know, what? What other alternatives are? I mean, the alternative is to be bombed um, uh, constantly in Iraq, or to uh, to be on the streets dealing drugs in uh, uh, somewhere in Austria, uh, or to live in an overcrowded apartment and uh, in a, with a much lower standard of living. I mean, these are the only alternatives available. Yeah, and um, I mean, once this guy has uh, learned to speak German at a reasonably efficient level. Um, and maybe has uh, maybe he's made some some friends that uh, will go to this gym, and uh, maybe they can help him out to, to get a job. And then he might might no longer be dependent on this woman. Maybe that sort of thing uh, can be worked out. But at least for now, it seems like she's his best alternative, yeah. or at least his uh, least bad option. And least taking bad. away someone's uh, least best uh, least bad option, aka the best option. Um, is not helping them. Yeah, yeah, and uh, it seems uh, the reason. Uh, and again, uh, I'm pretty sure that I'll, I'll see someone in the comment. Ah, you wouldn't say that if it were a, a lady. And I'm like, no, I would definitely say that if it were a lady, because yep. uh, because if it were a lady, uh, a young woman, it, that, that one actually happens a lot more. I mean, at the end of the day, 21 year old refugee women find the sugar daddy a lot faster than 21 year old refugee men uh, it's just the way it is um with that said um I, no matter what uh, no matter how bad it may seem from the outside um the, there there is such thing as i mean all trade-offs uh, that's why they're called trade-offs they, they have these um somewhat negative aspects but of overall they're preferable and if uh, the, the only reason this article seems a little bit weird because it's it's it attempts to in, to use the uh wrong but nevertheless prevalent um, 
uh, instinct of way too many people to to think that uh, uh, if if this had been a woman being quote unquote exploited by a fifty something year old man. A significant number of people, a plurality, let's say, I don't think it's a majority, but definitely a much higher plurality of people would think that's exploitation and they would, of course, be wrong. Um, so this article pretty much tries to use that instinct and try to flip the script. Um, and uh, it's weird for both for people like me, who are genuinely quite unsympathetic to these kinds of stories, whether it is with young men or young women, because, you know, I believe adults have agency. Um, but but it's also weird for those who do have these kinds of instincts because uh, um, because if they want to be consistent, then they would have to pretend that these that these uh, uh, this Hassan dude is a victim, uh, or they would have to admit that they have a double standard. Either way, they, it's a lose lose. So from a cultural perspective, this story is useful, although for the for the entirely different reasons that probably the journalists hoped for. Yeah. Although maybe the um, people opposed to this who come from the um, feminist side might just argue that uh, uh, these women have internalized their patriarchal um, <laughs> norms of uh, of sexuality and they um, they're sort of uh, um, living out uh, the male gender role in this uh, sort of relationship and uh, therefore should be condemned. Well. It might be true that some of them living out are living out this, but I don't think it should be condemned. I mean, it's still a free world, isn't it? Well, part it's partly a free world. Partly, at least in this department. Sorry, it should be free. It would be nice, but uh... yeah, it would be nice. But at least in this department of who you who you allow to live with you inside your house and who you have sex with, uh, that portion is still relatively allowed, they're relatively free or yep. still. I mean, we're not yet at the point where the feminists get to pass laws to tell us who we should find attractive or not. <sighs> amazing, amazing. I mean, look, I, I, I do tend to find, uh, well, um, the ones in, the, the case in Finland was a lot more extreme because they lured like 11, 12, 13 year old boys. And the, those, I think, uh, this should probably be uh, if not buried under the jail, definitely condemned and punished in some way, uh, especially the, on the lower cases of 11 and 12 year olds. Uh, but with these cases, I mean, if the minor is over 15, 16, uh, and especially this one, 24, what exactly is the problem? And I know this sounds a little bit extreme, but you know, this is true both in Iraq and in uh, and in Austria. You know, at 15, you're allowed to legally get married, work, pay taxes, have sex, have children, and whatnot. Uh, and the same is true in Iraq. So what exactly would be the problem even if he were 16? But, you know, 24, you know, painting him like a child? Give, give me a break, please. No. No, get some yep. accountability. And, uh, in fact, the, the, my problem is with the people who wrote this story initially, not with the refugee himself, because it seems like he, he does take some accountability. He's like, yeah, he put he she asked me to have sex with her for... Yeah, I don't buy that she loves me, but hey, I like the nice stuff. <laughs> uh, I mean, it, it seems to me that the refugee complains the least about the situation. Yep. All right. Let's go to the last one. Um, yeah, this one is again about Germany and also about Iraq. Uh, coming from the sun, uh, the article is yeah tabloid written, but so yeah, I've got a little bit from it. Facing death, schoolgirl 16 who fled Germany to join ISIS faces execution in Iraq as dramatic video shows her being dragged from jihad in Mosul. A schoolgirl who fled Germany to join the Islamic State faces execution after dramatic video footage emerged showing her being dragged from an ISIS lair in Mosul. Linda Benzel, 16, looks filthy, dazed and wounded as her capture is filmed by an Iraqi soldier from the Islamic State stronghold. Footage aired on the German newspaper Bild's website for the first time today shows the girl, dubbed as the Belle of Mosul, screaming as she is put uh, through walk of shame. In the video, two men as, uh, are seen le leading Linda away as she winces in pain from a wound. Linda, who converted to Islam as a 15-year-old schoolgirl in her, in her hometown Pulsnitz, or Pulsnitz, I guess, in eastern Germany last year, ran away from home to join the fanatics after being groomed online by an ISIS recruiter. 
Germany is negotiating with Iraqi authorities to get her back to Germany, where she faces charges of belonging to and supporting a terrorist organization. Wenzel could reportedly face trial for her actions, as it emerged that she was found with uh, a baby boy in her bomb-ravaged fortress. It is unclear what role she performed for the group in Mosul, but if she fought uh, uh, and killed for it, she could be star staring at a long jail term. One German magazine citing Iraqi security forces said that she and four German women uh, she was found with in the rubble of Mosul last month worked to the Islamic State morals police responsible for women adhering to strict dress codes. Those who did not obey faced a whipping or worse. Whether Linda Penzel was involved in brutalizing anyone is also unclear. <clears throat> um, yeah, first of all, the, mor the morality police uh, in any Sharia law state, not just the... Uh, 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 former ISIS, um, they're not responsible just for women adhering to strict dress codes. They're also responsible for um, anyone uh, drinking alcohol, anyone listening to music, anyone watching football, um, and all sorts of other things. I mean, you know, Sharia law is a very complicated set of rules, and uh, uh, the morality police is basically the uh, first and most important enforcer of it. Um, and, uh, you know, th there was a case, I, I think we covered it on the show um, when it happened uh, last year, I think, or maybe 16 months ago or something, um, where uh, uh, something like eight or 10 uh, uh, minor boys uh, aged between eight and 12 were executed for the horrible crime of having watched a football match. And they were also um, basically uh, snitched out by some... Uh, young lady who chose, to, who chose to join the morality police of the Islamic State. Now, I'm not saying this particular lady was the culprit, but I am saying that people like her, uh, even if they didn't directly brutalize anyone, uh, they were responsible for a lot of shit. I mean, if you worked for the morality police in a Sharia place for I even for a few months, let alone for over a year, uh, yeah, you probably did a lot of shit. Um, I don't understand why so much fuss about it, uh, other than because she's a girl. Because, you know, if she had been a young man, no one would have cared that much. I mean, basically, the perception is that, you know, uh, ISIS is uh, exploiting women and it's, uh, it's sexist, misogynist, and, uh, you know, women are treated as uh, slaves and so on. Um, but well, it depends on you know what what women we're talking about. Uh, yeah. um, if 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 you're a Muslim woman, you're not treated as a slave, um, and uh, it's it's not like Muslim. Yeah, I mean, in some sense, Muslim women are oppressed, but uh, they're also doing their share of the oppressing. Um, as certainly if if this one was part of this uh, mor uh, morality police, she probably did her part of uh, enforcing these uh, strict Sharia law rules. Mm -hmm. What would she, in, as an individual, this apparently is unclear, and of course she should not be um, uh, condemned solely on, based on like group membership. You have to actually look at what uh, she actually did. Um, but just based on her being part of this morality police, it's quite likely that she did some quite horrible things and uh, or enabled quite, some horrible things. Yeah, you know, or, or enabled them, um, and it's definitely an, an accomplice to them. And uh, therefore, I think it's quite reasonable that she gets a lengthy jail sentence. Yeah, and uh, let's not forget. I mean, in 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 a strict interpretation of Sharia law, for instance. Uh, you have to have a woman who whips another woman. Um, now, admittedly, in some Sharia uh, jurisdictions, they are not exactly that strict with that because there aren't enough women willing um, or strong enough to uh, uh, to successfully whip someone, uh, according to the, the Islamic doctrine, which, by the way, I mean, the Hadiths have even great details on how you should do the whipping. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's not a joke. Uh, but nevertheless, ISIS is actually, in, in these regards, is very, was, I should say, because it technically no longer exists, but, you know, the Islamic State was actually the most purest Sharia jurisdiction. I wouldn't say it's the state, but the jurisdiction. It was 
basically the most purest one. And uh, recently I, I was reading in, uh, I think it was in France, Van Kater, um, there is a, a splinter group in Pakistan that already launched a, a magazine for women uh, uh, teaching jihad to women and explaining and basically using the same ISIS methods uh, and explaining that essentially ISIS was the... Uh, was the most progressive in this regard. I mean, you know, they have like th they had like 30 or 35 percent women uh, suicide bombers, the, the most of any other Islamic group in history. Um, they had a, um, um, a much stricter Quranic, I would say, uh, enforcement of these kinds of um, uh, laws, including on the, the the sex of the enforcer, because these are things that are also described in the hadith. Um, and you know, other uh, jurisdictions ignore that portion, but you know, these guys didn't. Um, so yeah, um, quite frankly, I think uh, she should be tried in Iraq, uh, not in Germany, uh, for two reasons. Uh, one of them is because Iraq has harsher sentences, and um, I prefer that for uh, for jihadis. And uh, secondly, uh, you know, at the say what you want about the Iraqi security forces; they're definitely far less keen on human rights than the German ones, for sure. But uh, but they they were also most of them definitely were in the front lines of the of the war, so they tend to have uh, first eye experience with many of these people that they are now arresting, um, or they have footage of these people from the time when they, I mean you know they had spies inside the ISIS videotapes a lot of things, and those that did survive there is evidence of almost all of them what they did and and most of that evidence is stored in Iraq. So you know there would be much easier access to evidence, much uh, much more of a speedy trial. Sure, or if the German state wants to help with her defense, that would be fantastic. Although I think it shouldn't because traitors. Uh, but <laughs> if if they want to, that's fine. But I don't think she should be extradited to Germany. No, I think she should be tried there. She committed the crime in I the crimes in Iraq. So uh, why shouldn't the Iraqi law apply? Yeah, seems reasonable. I mean it. it, it if this sounds hard to uh, or to emotionally charge uh, charge to, to anyone listening, think about it this way. Um, let's say I um, I smoke weed on the street uh, in um, uh, in Stockholm. Now, both in my country and in Sweden, smoking weed on the streets is illegal. The problem is that in my country you get at a fine at best or nothing really, just a uh, you know a, a warning. Whereas in Stockholm, the punishments are closer to the United States. So, uh, but since I committed the crime in Stockholm, it would seem very reasonable for me to be tried under Swedish law rather than Romanian law. Same thing here. The crime were, the crimes were committed in Iraq, so why should should she be charged under the German law? Yeah, exactly. I mean, just just because you're a, a foreign national doesn't mean that. Uh... You should be tried at home for a crime you committed somewhere else. I mean, that, that if if you apply that sort of standard, then you, you just uh, set up some sort of um, um, I don't know state that uh, say um, legalizes murder, and then you can just go to a foreign country and murder people, and then to say, ah, I'm going to act extradite to my uh, to my home country where we think murder is totally cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, admittedly, there is. Um, uh, let's be fair. There is an, an argument to be made that um, some of these people, although I don't think this this chick um, falls under that, but some of these people that the Iraqi security forces have been arresting in the last twenty days or so uh, might actually qualify for international war crimes, uh, internationally recognized war crimes, rather than you know just crimes. And if it's in the latter category, then yes, it can be made the case that they can be tried anywhere because the laws are pretty much the same, and it's usually under the guise of the uh, Den Haag International Criminal Court, I think it's called. Um, but it's sketchy and we, um, and it's fishy. And with this particular case, I mean, um, she was working for the morality police, so even if she wanted to, she could not legitimately commit war crimes. So she just committed you know, regular crimes. Maybe more horrific, maybe not so much, but um, definitely things that could definitely uh, be tried under the normal Iraqi law. 
And yep. yes, uh, if she's found guilty of something really horrible, like, I don't know, snitching a few uh, kids uh, who eventually got executed for watching football or things like that, yes, she might face execution in Iraq. And I'm fine with that. Because I've, se- I've, I've been told on Facebook that, oh my God, you're so hardline on your own peer. And I'm like, no, first of all, uh, she's not my own peer and never has. And, uh, and uh, even if she had been, you know, the second you decide to fraternize with the enemy to such an extent, I'm sorry, you cease to be my own peer. Yep. Maybe I'm being too harsh. Maybe. Or maybe not. Right. Um, that's pretty much uh, all the news we had of a remarkably short uh, news section. But, uh, yeah, it is what it is. Uh, as I was saying at the beginning of the show, at the very least, uh, one, two, three weeks of break. So if if I'm lucky, I'll be able to uh, uh, get back on September the 8th. If I'm not lucky, September the 15th will be the next episode. Meanwhile, I'll be in three countries with crap internet. So this is the reason why we're not doing the show whilst I'm in a tour. Because uh, even if I could find the time, like I like I did in Sweden, uh, to actually host the show, uh, broadcasting using Hungarian internet, no, because no, I, I I don't know if you remember when we did the show and I was in Budapest, um, but that at that time we were doing it on Skype and it still got interrupted three times during the show, and Skype eats a lot less bandwidth than uh, mm-hmm. YouTube broadcast, so no, I'm not even taking the chance of attempting a YouTube broadcast on Hungarian internet. No, no, because no. (laughs) Right. I'm out of things to say, but I'm pretty sure you have one more thing to say. Okay, I would invite you to visit my blog, which is at orthogonalideas.com, where I post about a variety of uh, different topics. Uh, Most recently, I've uh, put up a book review of uh, Thomas Sowell's book, um, Black Rednecks and White Liberals. Very interesting book. Uh, um, yeah, I, I post about a wide variety of, of topics. Uh, just uh, um, look it up at orthogonalideas.com. And then I guess we'll see you in something like a month. And until then, take the red pill. Take the red pill. Goodbye, everyone.